In this video on how to write a symphony, we're going to take a look at the standard form for a symphony. Now, when I say standard form, of course, for every example I can show, I can also show an example of how to break that rule. When I say standard form of the symphony, I am typically referring to a four movement work. And this is the gold standard that emerges in the classical era. As such, we're going to be looking at two works from the classical era. A symphony by Mozart and a symphony by Beethoven. And even between those two symphonies, we will see differences in the standard form. In the next video after that, we'll look at atypical forms in the symphony. But let's go ahead and start with Mozart. We're going to look at symphony number 40. Symphony 40 is in G minor. It is one of only two symphonies Mozart would write that is in a minor key. We will have our four movement form here in this work. Let's take a look at movement one. Movement one in a standard uh, classical symphony is an allegro and typically it is in sonata form. Sonata form can be boiled down into a basic five-part structure. You have an A theme, then you have a contrasting B theme. In earlier times, this was often called the masculine theme and the feminine theme, but we've moved away from that terminology, meaning you would have a strong, aggressive theme followed by a much more gentle theme. But that terminology really does not suit the music or masculine and feminine very well at all. You would wrap up the... A theme and the B theme with a little tail end, and this is what we would call the exposition. Then you would have a development section. This is a C section, and in this you're going to develop on the themes from A and B. Finally, you will have the recapitulation, which is a repetition of A and B, the exposition from the beginning of the sonata form. The only difference is that the B theme, which was typically in a different key from the A theme in the exposition, is now typically going to be in the same key as the A theme. So to summarize that, in the opening allegro we have an A theme followed by a B theme, typically in a different pitch center. This forms the exposition. Then we have the development, which takes the A theme and the B theme and stretches them as far as you can go. Then you have the recapitulation, the recap, and that takes the A theme and the B theme and states them again, just like they were stated in the beginning. And this forms the whole of the first movement. Typically, this movement is always an allegro, meaning it's fast. And Mozart does this throughout all of his symphonies, with very few exceptions. Haydn would take, do a little bit different style. He would often open up his first movement with a short, slow adagio that would then just serve as a small prelude to the greater adag uh, allegro. Beethoven will use the same format in his symphonies. I have Beethoven Symphony 3 here. In, in, the, in this, he opens up with a big sonata form. Very, very similar to what Mozart will do. In, in fact, this form will stay with us throughout the classical era throughout the Romantic era, and we'll even see it in many 20th century compositions. The next two movements are not always set in stone. Movements three and four can be flip-flop from one another, but one will 
almost always be a slow movement and one will always be a fast dance-like movement. Typically we'll call this the adagio movement and the scherzo movement, though when we deal with Mozart we're going to call it a minuet because the term scherzo had not come around at the time of Mozart. In fact, the first symphonic scherzo we'll get is Beethoven III. Let's talk about the adagio and the importance of the adagio movement. Coming off of a fast allegro opening movement, typically we do go into the slow adagio. So the adagio typically comes second. Here's why. This is a big idea in developing symphonic movements, and that's the idea of catharsis. Each movement needs to cleanse the palate of the movement that came before it. So you have a fast movement, you follow that with a slow movement. It's a catharsis. It wipes away the feelings and the emotions that we had to give us something new. It's the uh, pickled radish in, in your uh, sushi experience. You have one flavor of sushi, then you put it down, you take a little bit of pickled relish, or pickled radish, and cleanse your palate a little bit and taste something new. Well, this is what symphonic composers will do between movements. Something new is our catharsis. The slow movement can be done in several different forms. It is not a strict, this must be done in sonata form, like the opening movement, but often it will be in sonata form. It can also be ABA form, or it could be a slow rondo, A, B, A, C, A, or it could be in a song form, or there's a whole myriad of forms that the adagio movement can take. The other middle movement is either a minuet, if we're dealing with works strictly from the classical era, like the works of Haydn or of Mozart, or after Beethoven, that becomes the scherzo movement. Scherzo literally means in Italian, a joke. This was meant to be a funny movement, though by the end of the 19th century, scherzos are anything but funny. They can be highly aggressive. Typically, your scherzo will be in three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Always fast, always uh, a real aggressive uh, driving rhythm. The, and the scherzo, or the minuet, always has a companion part to it called the trio. This typically has a very strict form. You have an A section that gets repeated, then you have a B section that gets repeated, then you go back to A again, then you go to the trio. Oftentimes the trio will be in a different key, it will often go to two instead of three, and you'll have a very similar pattern. A section, B section, A section again. And then you have a da capo. Go back to the beginning and repeat the whole scherzo again. So scherzo, trio, scherzo. The da capo is there and it just lengthens it by another third. Very rarely will the composer ever write out the second scherzo. Of course, one example where that happens is, well, Beethoven three, because Beethoven three, well, of course, being the original symphonic scherzo, literally does have a joke in it where he, for one measure, changes the meter on the repetition, throws in a 2-4 bar right at the end, and the joke is that it feels like somebody missed a beat. Finally, we get the finale. And again, the finale is a, a usually an allegro movement. Typically, the finale is in rondo form. Rondo form, you do a five-part rondo or a seven-part rondo. Five-part is A, B, A, C, A. A seven part is 
A, B, A, C, A, B, or D, A. The C in the seven part rondo can function as a development section taking on themes from A and B earlier on. When this happens, it's called a sonata rondo because it feels like a sonata form that we use in the first movement. It just gets you an extra part in the exposition. A, B, A, instead of just A, B, then C is our development, then A, B, and an extra A on the end. And it's as simple as that. Now, typically, when we have our fast finale, it comes right after our scherzo. So we have two fast movements next to each other, and we don't have that full catharsis. Beethoven would often link these two movements together, particularly he does this in Symphony 5. The scherzo just goes directly into the finale. But because there's a textural difference, the key will be different. It feels like this catharsis, even though the tempo doesn't necessarily change. You can give your listener a catharsis by changing something else, going from a dark key to a light key or a light key to a dark key, going from three to two or three to four, and so on in various different ways you can do that. In the next video, though, we'll talk about ways the composers break this traditional form. So to sum up, a typical classical symphony, and a symphony that will go become very standard throughout the 1800s, 1900s, and is still even used today, will have four movements. The first movement is an allegro in sonata form. The middle two movements can be interchanged. One will always be an adagio or a slow movement. One will typically be a fast dance like, either a scherzo or a minuet. And finally, we have the fourth movement, which is a fast finale, typically in rondo, sonata, or sonata rondo form. Again, next video we'll look at atypical forms. So, until then, Keep working on your symphony.